Right. Welcome everybody to Pruning Techniques for California Natives. I'm really excited to dive into this topic today. It's uh, one of our most highly uh, attended virtual horticulture talk, top, talks so far. Um, so that tells me that there's a lot to learn and maybe some people just need a little confidence in getting their pruning techniques down. So I'm looking forward to diving right in. Um, but before we do, I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Kristen Barker. I'm the Community Education Coordinator here at CalBG. And so today I'm just gonna be helping to facilitate the class. And so I'd like to point out that throughout the presentation, um, I encourage you all to use the Q&A feature. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be able to kind of pause periodically to address those throughout Ashley's presentation, but um, we'll have some more time at the end dedicated to uh, Q&A. So if your question doesn't get answered right away, don't worry, we'll have that time in the, at the end to address those. Um, also with that, we are recording this. Um, so we will be putting that recording on the digital content page of our website. So you'll have access to that. If you, you know, wanna go back and watch a technique or look at a diagram, that will be available to you. Uh, I typically have that up by the end of the day on Monday. So you can check back then and um, watch it there. And then lastly, um, I, I usually will send out a follow-up email. Uh, you know, our instructors typically mention a text or a website that you can use. And so don't worry if you don't get the full title down in your notes, I will send out that information to you after the class. So you'll have that available as well. And so I think that's it for me. And with that, I'd like to hand you over to Ashley Armstrong. She is the grounds manager here at CalBG. So she has a, a wealth of knowledge dealing with a wide variety of California native plants. And I'm looking forward to having her guide us through this topic today. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Ashley. Ashley, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, everyone. You know, it's, it's kind of funny not being able to see anyone here, but um, we, we will make do with ours in class in, in lieu of in person. Um, like Kristen said, my name is Ashley and I'm the grounds manager here at California Botanic Garden. Um, I've been with the garden for about five years now and I started initially as an intern with the nursery. Um, and prior to that, I had some farming experience on a, a vegetable production farm up in Petaluma. And uh, I have a certificate in horticulture science from Mount Sac. And my I also have some degrees in social science. So this is a, a little bit of a, a career shift for me, but, but I really enjoy it and I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, so that's a little bit about me and I, I wanted to ask you all a few questions just to get a feel for um, what are some of your main goals for in attending this class. And also if anyone has any specific plants that they have been wondering about how to prune or maintain um, so that we can make sure and try and cover those uh, throughout the course of the class. Um, and so I'll, I'll give a few minutes for, for people to respond and, and Kristen can help field some of those answers for us. Sure, so if, if you wanna um, go ahead and type in the chat, I can, I can uh, relay those to Ashley. So we have some interest in Coast Live Oak, um, people wanting to care, caring and maintaining California natives in their yard. Everything has gotten so huge after they planted it two years ago. Um, timing for pruning. Learning about pruning manzanitas. They're uh, here as they gradually replace garden with California natives and would like to know more. Somebody has been frustrated with runaway natives in their backyard garden. I'm guessing maybe like meaning volunteers, probably. I uh, want to stop killing my California native plants when I prune. I've killed Indian mallow and white sage. <laughs> So ceanothus and sages is another, manzanitas again, timing techniques for pruning, 
California sagebrush, how to prune that one. Oh, resources for finding a gardener that knows about natives. So lots of sages in there that they'd like to know about pruning times and differences between the various varieties. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so and then we have some other great topics, you know, about, yeah, uh, wondering about plants that are going to grow to six feet or more and look sparse and sometimes woody, especially some of the larger sages want to know how to make them look more filled in. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. So lots we, of great questions. <laughs> yeah, we have a, and, and some, uh, a lot of this will, will be covered and, and we can uh, try and make some, some time for, for things that, that I might have missed in, in the presentation. Um, so with that, we'll uh, go ahead and start with an overview of the class. And thank you, everyone, for, for participating. Um, there we go. Um, so we will be looking at the objectives of pruning, like why, why are we pruning our plants. Uh, we'll also cover some common pruning tools. And then we'll look at pruning techniques and how to make proper cuts. And then I'll go through a few examples, and then I will look at, at when to prune. Um, all right. So why, why do we prune? Um, there, there are a few main reasons why we would want to prune our plants. One, maybe to improve the health of the plant by removing dead material or diseased material. Um, and this could also include um, uh, so removing dead material, you're, you're basically hastening a natural process that uh, will allow more air circulation to, to occur for the rest of the healthy plant material. Um, Disease material, you can sometimes prune out, sometimes it's, it's often too late by the time that you're, you're seeing signs of, of disease. Um, but one tip in, in pruning back disease material would be to um, cut back quite a bit before the disease or dieback starts, um, just because the pathogen would, would be present also in the, the adjacent material. Um, you may want to improve the plant structural integrity, um, and that could include branches that are crossing. Uh, it could have co-dominant leaders um, and things of that nature. Uh, you may also want to improve the aesthetics and so that could be dead headings, taking off spent flower stalks, um, or just kind of shaping it more to your liking. You may also want to restrict the growth of your plants. And if, if you haven't overplanted in your garden, you shouldn't have too much of a problem with, with this issue. Um, but you will usually run into plants growing over into sidewalks or low hanging branches and pathways that are just kind of hazardous for, for people walking by. All right. And so now we're going to look at a few pruning tools. Um, and so basically, these are just tools that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. Um, and kind of the most important thing when you're choosing what tool to use is to choose the right type of tool for, for the size of of the cut that you're gonna making, that you're going to be making. So you, we have, uh, and you don't wanna use like hand pruners for something that's like an inch in diameter. You know, no, not only is it gonna be hard for, for you to, to do, it's, it's likely to cause some damage to the branch or stem that you're trying to cut and it might mash that and, and will not accomplish what you set out to accomplish. With with your pruning. Um, on the far left hand there are some of the screen, there are some uh, needle nose pruners, which are really lightweight and really easy to handle um, herbaceous material. Um, it's just easier on your hands to have a more lightweight tool um, than your standard pruners. Uh, Felco is, is a really good brand. 
Um, and and then if if you have any grip issues, there are also some printers that have uh, a ratchet built in, um, and those are helpful if if grip is an issue for you. Um, we also have the head shears on the far right of the screen, which we don't usually use in in native plant gardening, especially in the garden, but there are a few instances where you, where you might be able to use those, which we'll go over a little bit later. Um, and then we have the loppers and hand saws, and I usually like to keep uh, a couple hand saws with me. Um, the saw pictured in the middle has a shorter blade, and it's a lot easier to maneuver in plants that have a denser canopy. So you don't nick any branches that, that are healthy and you want to maintain on the plant. Um, and then there are also pole saws and pole pruners. If you're uncomfortable using ladders, um, they're, they're very helpful. And um, if you are looking for, like, as soon as you start getting into your larger trees um, and, and larger branches, it's usually a good idea to to hire a certified arborist um, so that you avoid damaging a, a really nice established specimen. Um, and basically just keep your tools clean and sharpened. So like I said earlier, you don't damage any of the, the plant material with a dull blade. Um, and sanitizing tools, uh, like I mentioned with the diseased material, we usually sanitize with 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol. Um, we found it's a little bit less corrosive than, than a 10% bleach solution, which you can also use. Um, but it's the isopropyl is kind of an easy um, solution. You can use a spray bottle and, and just spray in between each cut if, if you're concerned about contaminating your, your plant material. All right. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to pruning techniques? Yeah, Ashley, do you lightly oil your tools to keep rust off? Um, we will use some WD-40 to kind of clean any any rust off of the tools every once in a while, um, but we don't regularly oil the, the tools. Great. I, I think that was the only tool questions so far, um, more just the, the beginning questions that we'll get to a little later, I think. All right. Okay, so we're gonna move on to pruning techniques. Oh, sorry, Ashley, how, yeah. do, you, how do you sharpen a, a bypass pruner? Um, so there, you can, there are a few ways. You can, you can either take the, the clipper apart and, and use a, um, a sharpening stone, or there are also uh, really small sharpening tools that you can just use without. That they're fairly inexpensive, um, and and then you can also use a, a file to to clip off any of the burrs that that occur when you use with the file. Um, if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to move on to pruning techniques. Um, so deadheading is uh, essentially removing spent flower stalks. Um, and it's basically to improve the aesthetics of your garden. Um, if you are deadheading and you and habitat is important for your garden, you may want to consider waiting until the um, until the flowers are completely dead and the seeds have formed, um, just to provide some some fodder for for small animals and birds. Um, well, if you're deadheading in the springtime, for many plants, you'll find that they'll be able to push a second bloom. Um, the trichostoma, the uh, cultivar of trichostoma, the midnight magic or woolly blue pearls. Um, if you deadhead that continually, it, it will bloom all year long. 
Um, but sages, verbenas, uh, woolly blue curls, and celia, those are all plants that, that you would be, be deadheading. Um, pinching is a technique that we don't use often in the garden, um, but you, you can use it to, uh, it encourages new growth. Um, and it basically is just removing the, the, the closest material to the end of, of, new, of a new stem. Um, so it'll produce a flourish of, of new growth there. Um, you can pinch Ceanothus after it's finished blooming, um, you, which, so just removing the, the small amount of material that is left where the, the flower has, has been spent. Um, you, can, you can also pinch some of the, the island snapdragons. You can pinch some of the um, sages. I, I wouldn't do that to white sage necessarily, but maybe some of the, the Cleveland sage, which are a little more, uh, they have kind of a more vigorous growth habit than, than your white sage. Um, and if, if you are pinching sage, you are going to want to be careful because you may run into a point where you're pinching off the, um, if buds have already set and you, you may end up with no flowers if you cut those off in the springtime, which would be disappointing. Um, coppicing is also a, a common technique that, that we use. And coppicing, people are sometimes afraid to do because you're essentially cutting the, the plant down to the ground or just leaving about a foot of material. Um, so there are, there are a few plants that can be coppice. Uh, Epilobium is one or um, a California fuchsia. Um, and that can be cut down to the ground and we'll look at some examples of that later in the presentation. Um, in Celia, Californica or brittle bush, we, we coppice regularly. Um, some of the baccarus or coyote brush can, can be coppiced as well. And that's one that we would not coppice every, every year. It might be every four years, say, just to rejuvenate some of the, some more dense growth. Um, shearing is, uh, with like the hedging shears that we showed in the tool section earlier, is something that we don't usually do in the garden, but there are a few plants you, you can shear baccarus, um, and there are a few plants that I don't know, like Bahiopsis, and the common name for that is not coming to me at the moment, but it, I, and I don't know how common it is in the nursery trade, so, uh, you, but it has very small leaves and just a profusion of flowers to where it would just be impossible to cut them to deadhead individually. So that would be an instance where your shearing would be appropriate. Um, edging and uh, is another technique. Uh, and I think people often think of using a string trimmer for along their lawns on the sidewalk. Um, but edging can be done very artfully. Um, and when you have plants that are growing into a pathway, uh, most native gardens are not a very don't have a very formal appearance, um, so you can cut a plant back naturally. Um, you want to try and make your cuts rather inconspicuous, so avoid cutting um, at at the same point along the pathway or whatever your your edge may be. If you kind of make variations in how far back you cut, so it has kind of a natural. Um, edge and also cut from underneath the plant so it's a little bit less conspicuous. Um, hedging is something that that we don't usually do. There are a few common native plants that can take hedging. Um, your Rus ovata and integrifolia, the, which is the um, lemonade berry and uh, Rus ovata is um, that's not coming to me either right now. <laughs> um, sugar bush, sugar bush and lemonade berry. Um, they can be hedged uh, and so can mat, mat, wax myrtle. Um, and when you're, 
if you are going to hedge and you have kind of a square shape, it's important that you taper as you get towards the top of the plant. Um, that way, there you're still going to allow light to hit the bottom branches of, of and leaves of the of the plant. So if you have a hedge that is perfectly straight up and down, you're probably going to see some die back at the at the base of the plant because there's just it just won't receive the the light that's necessary for it to to continue to thrive. All right, and now we're kind of moving a little bit more into some of the small shrubs and, and trees um, in terms of corrective pruning. Um, I mentioned a little while ago that crossing branches might be something that you would want to remove. And pictured here on the right um, is, a, is a buckeye. And you can see this, this smaller branch is, is crossing over the, the larger lateral branch. And so, Eventually, this could rub against the two branches could rub against each other, and that would not allow a proper callus to form, and so that would be a point that would be prone to to infestation from uh, any pathogen. So that would be uh, something to to remove, and it also it just has a very odd growth habit. You can see it it starts growing uh, more vertically and then kind of does a very drastic um move down towards the towards the ground so so that that would be a, a branch to remove um also the angles of of some of your branches uh as they attach to the to the trunk of the tree the wider the angle the more stable the the branch will be um so if you have some branches that are very narrow uh like 40 about 40 degrees or, or so, um, that could be a candidate for removal, just so you have a, a stronger connection to the main trunk and provide for, so to ensure the structural integrity of, of the tree. Um, heading and thinning are, are also used in both shrubs and, uh, and small trees. Um, Heading, you're you're basically shortening the branch, uh, pulling in the the uh, basically circumference of, of the plant, um, and we'll talk about in the next slide. We'll we'll look at where you would want to cut if you were heading back a plant. Um, thinning is also used just to remove entire branches of the plant, just to allow again more air circulation to to material that, that you want to be there and remain healthy. Um, and thinning can, you, the diagram on the, on the far right is just a, a shrub that has been thinned. You can, you can see the older branches have been chosen. Um, red buds are can, good candidates for thinning, like in this manner. Um, if, since it's a multi-trunk tree, you can have some older, uh, branches that kind of just start to look old and straggly after a few years and you can just cut those back and it will just keep rejuvenating new, new growth and new stems and, and it'll keep it looking a little bit young and fresh. Um, cornice or dogwood uh, you can you can also thin in, in a similar fashion um, and the younger shoots it'll keep a, a more vibrant red color in, in its dormancy. Um, so that's a, a desirable trait if, if, you're, if you have any of those. Um, so so if you are- Actually, oh, yeah. do you mind going back to the, the slide with, um, with the buckeye and kind of circling with your cursor uh, oh, yeah. where you would prune? Yeah, so here's the problem area of the branch. And so I would cut, and it has this kind of very odd growth habit right here. I would cut it right at this point here. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're kind of going to look at where to, you would want to make a cut. 
So if you were heading back a branch or if you have uh, a shrub that you're pruning, um, where the best place is to cut. So we'll look at a little bit of vocabulary here. You can see in the photograph, um, you have nodes and internodes and buds. And nodes are basically just the, the points of the plant of the plant where leaves, buds, or other lateral stems or branches are going to grow from. Um, and the internode is just the, the space in between each node. And so if we're pruning, we we want to go close to the to the node here. We want to stay away from pruning something at just below a node because you're going to have this this space which is could invite mold or, or contamination um and if if it doesn't do that it it just looks like a a stick and it's it's just kind of aesthetically not not pleasing um so when you when you do make your cut um you can see the the buds are uh, angled a little bit. You want to cut at the same angle, about a 45 degree angle, and going in the same direction as your bud. Um, and the buds will also tell you which direction new growth is going to come from. So if you have a grapevine, for instance, and you want it to uh, along a fence, you're you're going to want to make your your cut your say it's it's January, which is a good time to, to cut back a, a grapevine. Um, you want to make a cut in front of a node here that would be pointing in the direction of the fence. So it's less work on your part to actually train the plant to, to go into the fence, which it will naturally do. And so Ashley, uh, uh, it seems like with grapevines you would cut new growth are there other plants that where you'd want to cut out new growth versus old growth or are you most commonly cutting out old growth um for i mean it, it kind of depends on on the plant that you're look you new growth you are more likely to um to pinch back say so just take this this portion off to have uh, more a uh, more densely growing plant uh, so it's usually the older growth that you would be looking at um, for and I'm kind of thinking of shrub shrub material and, and small trees um, and there are instances where um, like sages for example it's not advised to cut into old growth. Um, so it, it, it won't necessarily kill the plant, but it, it's not gonna come back necessarily at that point, at that point where you cut. Right. Uh, and so kind of with that, with like the sages, about how many, and pinching, how many buds would you remove when you are pinching? Um, this person is specifically thinking about Cleveland sage, like a, a hybrid, like Alan Chickering. I would only take like to about there to the second second bud, um, and then again with the with the sage, um, you would just be careful that you're you're not cutting off um, points where flower buds have already set so because you don't want to take out your flowers for for the springtime great thank you all right um and so this is all also applying to uh small trees and woody shrubs um when you have branches that you're you're looking to remove you're you're gonna notice that there's some swelling at the base of the branch. And this is called the branch collar. And it's where the trunk tissues overlap with the branch tissues. Um, and there's also gonna be a bark ridge where the uh, branch meets the, the trunk bark. And the branch collar is this special area 
that you don't want to uh, cut into. And it, it has uh, cells that can create chemicals and enzymes that will allow the tree to compartmentalize. Um, so basically, if this branch here becomes infected or has some pathogen of some, some sort, this branch collar will create cells to compartmentalize at that at this point so that the that it will be isolate the pathogen from the rest of the tree. So when you when you cut a branch, you want to cut, make your cut about here, which so you're not disturbing the branch collar, but it also should be close enough to the branch collar so that it can effectively make a callus over that point. So if you make a cut, if you leave stumps, like um, which it, are basically cuts that are too far away from, from the branch collar or node, if you're doing cutting smaller shrubs or herbaceous material, um, you're, the, uh, the branch, it's gonna be less effective in its ability to have a, a good solid um, healing callus of that area. So the, these are some examples of, of a good cut and a bad cut. You can see in the, in the good cut here, the collar is, is intact um, and the, the cut is at a, an angle with the, the collar and it's uh, not too far away from, from the collar. And then the bad cut here is just flush with the trunk and it cuts off of the collar, leaving it more susceptible to, to disease and pathogens. And this is an example of another buckeye. Uh, this was pruned to remove dead wood. And you can, you can see in the, in the picture, there's a little bit of swelling at the base where, where the collar is and the cut has been made, not disturbing the collar, but close enough to the collar to, so that it can effectively create a, a callus for the wound. And the same is true over here. And then I have an example of, of some bad cuts. Um, this was uh, near a walkway. And so I assume this was cut to remove it from, from the walkway, from getting in, into people's way. But you can see that they're, these, these would be considered stumps. They're very far from the collar. Um, and since this is a smaller branch, if you can kind of follow it back. A more proper way to have pruned this would be to follow this branch all the way back to the trunk and, and cut it there. Um, so that's an example of a bad cut. Um, and if you are pruning trees, small trees that have uh, branches that are one to two inches in diameter, um, it's best to make a, a three part cut. And so the, because if you, if you just were to cut your branch here, um, then the weight, the sheer weight of this branch would cause the bark underneath here to just strip down the, the trunk of the tree. So to avoid that, you would make your first cut underneath the branch at the one. And it doesn't have to be a, a large cut. And depending on the size of the branch, it can be like half an inch to to an inch or so. And then your second cut is gonna be beyond that. And that's gonna relieve the weight of the entire branch. And it will, it, there, it will like crush this piece here. Um, and it will uh, stop the stripping from happening to the rest of the, um, to the trunk. And then it'll leave you with a little stub. And so you're gonna be able to make a final cut very cleanly. Um, just above the, the branch collar. Um, and that's a common practice that we, we use quite often and it's, it's very helpful and it saves a lot of our trees <laughs> of damage. Um, are there any questions after that? Um, well, kind of going back to um, talking about old wood on sage. So mm -hmm. somebody is curious um, if, so if you're, 
avoiding cutting old wood on sage, is there no way to cut back and shape an overgrown sage, specifically Cleveland sage and white sage, that they're kind of overrunning their garden at this point? Um, I, I have seen um, on Las Politas website, I have seen them cut into Cleveland sage cultivars and to older wood and probably to about two two feet of plant remaining plant material and it has come back in in their examples um but i have not had that experience specifically um white white sage um it it might just be a you might just have to re if it's too old and too woody then it you might just have to replace the the plants um, unfortunately um, if if it's not pruned if the younger growth is not pruned regularly then it it will be a little harder to deal with when you're just cutting into the hardwood. Great. <laughs> yeah, no. That's the most hopeful answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you could kind of try it out and then if it, if yeah. it doesn't come back, then you know you need to replace yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, there there is a lot of experimenting with, with native plants also. And if you have something that you don't have any literature on or there you just can't find it anywhere else and you have it in your yard, um, it, it's nice to observe it over the course of a year or two just to see what the growth habit is um to see how you might possibly treat it um if if you have something that is pushing out new growth from the base you may be more likely to be able to coppice it than something that pushes out new growth from existing stems in the springtime or whenever it starts growing uh then you would probably not want to coppice that and be a, a bit more conservative with your your pruning um but yeah we will go on to some some deadheading uh examples and there there are some coppicing examples here um i i have uh, muted the sound on the videos uh so there's nothing wrong with your your computer um, the sound just didn't turn out very well here, so we're I'll just kind of talk through it um, as we go. So this is an example of deadheading sage. It's uh, Salvia lupa phylla or uh, purple sage, um, and you can hopefully see a, a little bit. Um, you can see the the dead flower stalks there are still around which was nice for for an example and basically you're you're just going to take your your pruners and cut to the first green leaves that are that are on the plant um and you one thing to try and avoid is just to cut the the actual flower stalks off because then you'll you're not going to be doing anything for the aesthetics and you're going to end up with a bunch of stick-like material sticking out of your plant and so this is basically just moving around the plant you can go down to the second or third leaf if you want to cut it back a little bit more or give it a little bit more shape but that's essentially what's what's happening here um yeah. and this is kind of and this is true of uh, pretty much most sages and how we, we deal with deadheading. There's not a, a huge amount of variation between them. Um, white sage is probably the, the most different between all, just because the flower stalks are so thick um, and you often don't have a lot of leaf material to, to come back to. Um, so it's, you you often don't have the choice to come down to like the second or third set of leaves on the plant. Um, you're just kind of 
stuck with with the first set of beliefs. Um, so Ashley, before you move on, um, what what time of year would you be pinching sage and our what type of year is best for like pruning sage? Is it kind of a year round? Um, or so, are you waiting till after bloom? That kind of that. So pinching sage would usually be when, when you're first starting to see new growth. Um, at, it would be like the most, the softest material that you have. Um, just very early spring is when you would want to pinch and again don't wait too late to do if you're interested in doing that um and deadheading um you can deadhead throughout the spring um to try and encourage a second bloom um but if again if you are interested in wildlife in your garden then you may want to wait and have uh the seeds develop so so that could happen throughout the spring or just um in the in the summertime after it's finished blooming the summer fall um hopefully that that answers your question um and this is an example of where i i did cut into some older wood and some allen chickering um you can see this is a, a seat wall that the the sage was encroaching upon and we wanted a a clean area so this is an example of uh like edging where the material was cut back to the same point at throughout and it just kind of has a there's just a lot of woody material and um it doesn't have a very clean look um so i i did cut into the into the old wood and i'm not expecting any new growth to to come from this point um, but it just it does just clean up the the look of the plant um, so that that is an, an option for for seeds um, and then i have a, another video of uh the woolly blue curls being deadheaded or trichostoma lanata and trichostoma is a lot easier to deadhead just because the the internodes are the space in between each each leaf node is significantly smaller and so you can be able, you can afford to be less picky about where where you cut and you can see there there's a flower stalk that has three uh, stalks and so you want to when you're deadheading you essentially want to make as few cuts as possible um, so if you do have uh, like a three pronged um, flower stalk you you want to go below just below that just because you'll you'll end up if you just go right under each flower stalk you're going to end up with a kind of a funny growth habit with just lots of um, shoots coming out from each point that you've cut so it'll just have a little bit of a cleaner appearance oh. Um, this is California fuchsia or, or Epilobium conum. Yeah, I'll play this video as well. And this is a, a late blooming, blooming plant. <laughs> um, so this is about the time that you would want to coppice it. And you can see it just gets really straggly and dried out. Um, and it will start coming back from the base. Um, we we try to zoom in a little bit. I don't know if it's it's that visible, but you're basically just going to cut down the entire plant to about an inch. Uh, you're going to leave an inch of material, um, and you will have uh, a lot of times you'll see the new growth starting to come out, and you can just cut back to that point and just kind of be careful not to cut into that growth. Um, and you can cut it back if there is no new growth. It just, um, people are sometimes wary to do that and it makes them feel better to have some new growth actually there. Um, it, it makes me feel better too. <laughs> but uh, so, so that's basically how, how we deal with the epilobium. And if, if it looks 
okay for one year, you can skip coppicing and, and do it the next year. But we, for a lot of our, our epilobium, we will end up coppicing it every year. And this is just a, in case the video was hard to see, this is just a before and after picture. You can see all the old dead stalks here. Um, and this is just a, a cleaned up, um, excuse me, photo of epilobium that's get, been coppiced and with the, the new growth there. And so Ashley, uh, did, can you tell us again when you were coppicing California fuchsia and then also how long after planting it would you coppice, coppice it? Um, I, would, I would wait to coppice it. If, if you've just planted epilobium, then I, would, I wouldn't coppice it right away. I, I would let it kind of run its course for at least for the first year. Um, and, but in general, now is, is the time to, to cut back the epilobium in the late fall. Because it, I mean, depending on the season, it, it can keep blooming into the fall. So winter time would be the time to, to cut it back. Um, it, if you're in a really cold area, you, you might wanna wait even longer until March because that that dead material or will will provide the new growth some protection from frost. Um, so if if that's in it, like it's not too bad of an issue for us here the, most of the time. Um, but if you are in a colder area, then that that might be something to keep in mind. Um, this is. Uh, Encelia californica or, or brittle bush. Um, and it, it generally tends to look a little bit terrible in the summertime. Uh, so we, we do coppice it um, to about a foot of, of growth. Um, and this we just do with loppers. Um, and we're not terribly careful of like to about nodes and where we make the cut on along the stem just because it's it's such herbaceous growth that that comes up um, but it, it will look something like this once once you've finished coppicing and a few depending on the time when you coppice a, a few weeks or months later it, it will start pushing out new growth um, and it it does make a significant difference in the in the you can tell when which ones have been coppiced and and which ones haven't based on uh, their their appearance in the springtime. It, it they they look quite a bit nicer after they've been cut back. Um, and this is a a small tree. This is the Palo Verde, and so this is just an example. This small branch. Um, it has out here, further past the, the camera, it kind of hangs down. This is in the container garden. So um, it's often is in the way of people and hits people on the head as they walk through. So we're just going to remove that branch from, from the tree. And we're just gonna cut it back to, the, to this lateral branch here. And you can see uh, where my fingers are. There's a little bit of a swelling which will be the, the branch collar. Um, so we're, we're not gonna cut into that material, but we'll, we'll cut at, at that point. Um, and I, I chose some, some pruners because it's a little bit too, too large of a branch for, for hand pruners. And it, it, it did hit the cameraman there, but, but it was okay. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so that, that would be some minor pruning on, on a, on a small tree. Um, and then when to prune, um, does any, are there any other questions? Of there's, there's a good amount of questions. I might hold on to them because, uh, they're okay. more about specific, um, plant species. And so you might answer a few of those in your next slides. Um, all right. But yeah, monkey flowers is one that's been mentioned by a few people. Matilla hot poppies, 
Okay. Um, and let's see, um, desert willow. So yeah, kind of more about specific species. Yeah. So maybe we'll hold off on answering those. Okay. So okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're we're gonna look at kind of general guidelines about when to prune. Um, so you can generally prune plants after they've flowered or just before they'll be pushing out new growth. Um, like the bathyrus for it, the um, coyote brush was is one that you would cut back just before it starts pushing out new growth. And the sages, you're deadheading after they've flowered. Um, Cianothus, you can pinch back after they've flowered. Um, you're gonna wanna prune deciduous trees during their dormant period. Um, just it's it's a healthier time for them and they're it's a lot easier to see what what you're actually doing um, and then plants that are susceptible to pathogens um, should be pruned in the summer when infection is least likely and this would include um, like your manzanitas uh, your your evergreen oaks um, like the coast live oak and uh, the, the uh, goodness, any of your scrub oaks, um, but so so that's Ceanothus. If you're making larger cuts, would would be in the summertime. Um, and I just have a few species on here, and there there are um, some pruning calendars out there. Um, Yerba Buena Nursery has has a calendar that's that's kind of useful. Um, and uh, Las Politas Nursery will have um, just, they usually have a, quite a bit of information about um, plant care in, in general that is, is useful. Um, so summer and fall, um, manzanita species, and we, we do not prune our manzanita species. Um, they generally don't take that well you you can pinch some of them and Howard McMinn is more forgiving than um, than pretty much any other manzanita species for pruning but generally we we only prune out the dead material in in manzanitas and we only do it in the summertime when it's dry because they are susceptible to pathogens um, that are that are waterborne um, and we are, we're also very careful about sanitizing our tools when, when we're pruning both manzanita and cianopis um, for those reasons. Um, and a lot of your, your larger evergreens, the toy on sugar, sugar bush, lemonade berry, um, wax myrtle can, can be head or thinned or headed back in the summertime. You're going to have a lot of deadheading, uh, monardella, verbena, sages in, in the summer and fall. It, you can coppice here in Celia. Um, in the fall and winter, uh, you can cut back some of your Malica thamnus and the Artemisia californica. Um, you can cut it back by half or just deadhead. Um, you can coppice the Matillaha poppy to about six inches um, and and it'll come back pretty quite well. Um, if, if you do cut it back too, too far and it doesn't, isn't as um, robust as you would like it to be the following year, I, I would just not coppice it the following year and so that it can hold on to some of those carbohydrates to, to get it to where you want to be. And if, if you do do that, um, you can just kind of leave off or get rid of some of the persistent dead leaves just to give, give it a little bit of a nicer look. Grapevines you'll uh, cut back uh, in the winter time. Uh, cornice or dogwood, um, Bacchus filialaris you can coppice in the, in the winter time. Um, and then you like elderberry and red buds are also dormant in the winter time, and it's a it's a good time to to prune. Um, 
So that, those are just some general, without going into too many examples, um, guidelines of, of pruning. And so I guess I can take some of the specific. Sure. So yeah, I, I um, so do you have any recommendations about pruning monkey flowers? Monkey flowers, um, you can, I would probably cut back uh, by a third after they've bloomed in the in the summertime um, or or later into the fall when they're about to uh, push out some new growth. Okay. And then oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna um, move you kind of mentioned uh, Matilla hop poppy but somebody asked how to trim and control Matilla hop poppies. Is it okay to coppice and what time of year? So if you don't mind repeating that. Yeah, so the Matilla hop, did, did you mention something about controlling? Like, Yeah, they asked to trim and control. I think just like okay. keeping it okay. under control. Yeah, so, so Matilla hop poppy, you, you can coppice um, to about six inches. Um, if you coppice it further than that, it, it, you're not going to kill the plant, it will come back, but it, it probably won't be as, as robust as, as you'd like. But you can coppice it back to six, about six inches or six to a foot every, every year and it should be okay. And, and you'll do that in fall and winter, right? Yeah, fall and winter. And then somebody asks, um, if they didn't prune a California, I think, I think they mean grapevine one year, is that okay? What happens if they don't prune? Their vine in one year. Yeah, no, it it is it it's okay. <laughs> it's not gonna it's not gonna kill the plant, um, or any. It, but yeah, it's it's good practice to do it if you don't do it one year. We have some that we rarely cut back in the garden, and and they're they're just fine. It, yeah, it it's not like a hugely negative impact on the, on the plant to not to prune it. In the, it'll just be maybe a little bit less of vigorous growth, but it'll be, there's no problem. Great. It, so I guess I'm going to ask some kind of more um, questions. There's a lot of species questions, but um, I have a question. Do you recommend treating the cut with a sealant product? Um, Sealants have, have kind of fallen by the wayside largely um, for a few reasons. They're um, like the, the color and the material that they're made out of are, they absorb heat. And so it, it's, um, I, And now I'm going to forget the science behind why they're they're not good, <laughs> but they're generally uh, not recommended. And it's more important that you make a correct cut um, rather than trying to cover it with a sealant. Um, so, yeah, so no no sealants are necessary, and just make sure that you're making a proper cut, and you won't have to to worry about sealants. Great. And so kind of going back with proper cuts, um, what happens if you were to leave a stub, like you were mentioning, not to leave a stub, what would happen if you did? So if, if you do leave stubs, it'll just be harder for the, for the plant to create a, a good uh, callus over the wound. Um, so either it, it is more likely that it can become infected or it it'll just take longer for it to callus over and so so it's kind of one of two things it could either damage the tree or it if if it's able to create a proper callus despite it being a stub then then it will be fine okay and uh, I just wanted to point out, I, I'll, I'll get you all PDFs of Ashley's slides so that you can check back on this when to prune calendar. Um, so I'll send that out in the follow-up email. 
Um, and and they're all give you the the links. There there's some various calendars that are a little bit more um, specific that I I can I can send you to to forward along also. And do you recommend any books that deal with pruning California natives that might be great yeah. for homeowners especially? Yeah, there's um, uh, Bart O'Brien put out. I have I have one right here. It's called Care and Maintenance of uh, Southern California Native Plant Gardens, um, and it's very helpful. It has like a really wide range of of plants and descriptions about how to care for them. Um, and it's easy to navigate and yeah, it, it's helpful to, to have around. Great. And so I, I think I'm going to kind of maybe go through some of the, um, the more, the species questions, if that's okay. So, yeah. Yeah. um, is it okay to hedge a bladder pod? Um, what pruning technique do you recommend for, for that? Um, you you can cut back a bladder i i wouldn't hedge a bladder pod necessarily um i think if it it's looking old and straggly you can kind of cut back i i don't i would probably not cut back more than a third of of the plant if it's a larger plant um but they're they're generally not pretty low maintenance plants. And um, so kind of back to Matilla hot poppies, people are worried about the hot spell that we just had. Um, it's kind of growing now. Should they go ahead and coppice it? Um, it's it's a little, a little bit late to, to coppice, but you can you can cut it back because um, it's it's just starting to push out new growth and it'll it should be okay, um, but a little bit earlier in in the season would be better. Okay. Yes. And can you repeat the name of the the book? Uh, so people yeah. yeah, it is Care and Maintenance of Southern California Native Plant Gardens. And then let's, so we had a question um, about buckwheats. Can you recommend um, when and how you would prune buckwheat? Buckwheats you can, you can prune in the, you can deadhead buckwheats um, and you can cut them back. Um, I, I wouldn't cut them back to the ground. We've had, very mixed results with that. Um, we've uh, some have come back and some have not. Um, so if you are going to interested in more aggressive pruning, then I I would definitely leave about um, at least six to eight inches of material and with make sure there are some green leaves so it can still photosynthesize. Um, and I'm thinking of fasciculatum here, um, the California buckwheat. Um, is there is there a specific buckwheat? Uh, they just, yeah, Edgar, uh, mentioned buckwheats in general. No specific one, I don't think. I didn't see, but yeah, Cal California. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and what about Calif or Channel Island poppies, do you, are those pruned or? Um, you, you can uh, kind of prune those back a, a, a little bit. Um, we don't usually prune ours because they, they generally have a pretty nice shape um, and growth habit. Um, if you can pinch it back if, if you're adamant about it. Um, but generally, we we don't we don't prune the the channel island poppy. Gotcha. And uh, for summer deciduous plants in general, should they be pruned while they're dormant in summer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, 
And you kind of talked about not really pruning manzanitas. Um, or, and so someone has a very overgrown bushy manzanita. Is that doomed, she asks? <laughs> um, you, you can prune it back, um, but it, it generally, a lot of times they, they won't have, like if you, if you cut things back, they won't have more, it won't generate new growth really. So if you are thinning it out, um, it's just going to have a really sparse canopy, um, which may or may not be to your liking. Um, right. it, yeah, I, I mean, you, you can try and do some, we, we have had to remove significant branches from, from manzanitas and, and they, they do survive, but they're, and maybe that's, that's good in this case that they, they won't necessarily have new growth at those points. Right. Thanks. And so kind of, someone has a specific buckwheat, coast buckwheat, coastal buckwheat. Do you? Oh, is that the cenarium? The area? Uh, latifolium. Latifolium. Um, yeah, I might look that. Oh, yeah, I might look that one up actually. And um, while you're kind of thinking through that one, um, back to the manzanitas, I guess they they were thinking that you know the the manzanitas here at the gardens that the trunks are really beautifully exposed, mm -hmm. and so they thought or they're asking is that more naturally that they're exposed that way or um, do we prune at all to expose them in that? In that um those those are the natural growth growth habits of, of the plants in the garden there there's very minimal pruning of of the manzanitas okay so the mainly the only exposure would be if there are dead branches and limbs that that need to be removed um and that will open up the the plant a little bit um, also, manzanitas sometimes will start to get die back, and their like the the posture of the leaf will change a little bit, and they'll start to get some chlorosis or yellowing, um, and that could also be a, a point that you would want to prune out and again sanitize and only do it in the summertime. Um, but yeah, generally, the that is the natural habit of of the plant. Gotcha. And so, and can you repeat about what time of year you were pruning buckwheats? Buckwheats probably in the summertime after after they've after the blooms have turned brown. Great. Um. Summer fall into the fall. And. Do you have any thoughts about coyote mint um, with pruning and typically what's its lifespan? Um, coyote, excuse me, coyote mint, you can, you can deadhead or you can, uh, I mean, that's one that you could possibly shear depending on um, the number of blooms or you could, or you can just pinch them off. Um, and the, the lifespan isn't, isn't huge. It's probably, about five five years or so. Okay. And um, any recommendations about pruning desert willow? Um, I just treat it as as a small any small tree. Like the number one would be removing any dead material, um, and then any structural issues um, and any areas that are. Uh, that are hazardous for people walking by. Um, some of them do have odd growth habits. So you can, if you wanna train it into a small, if it's kind of shrubby in nature and you want to turn it into a small tree that could, could be a, a structural 
change by these techniques. Um, but when it's dormant, so about about now, um, and yeah, just make make proper cuts. Yeah. It, and what about if like uh, something's getting too big, specifically a uh, laurel sumac? Mm -hmm. The laurel sumacs are they're pretty tough plants. Um, you can you can coppice them if it's and it'll they'll come back. Um, or you can you can head the plant. You can thin it. Um, you have you have some quite a few options there uh, for what what to do, but they're generally quite tough and can can handle some some pruning. Okay. And um, uh, back, back to buckwheats, they're popular. Is there really, a, is there a need to deadhead and prune or is it more just for aesthetics? It's just for aesthetics. There's, we, we don't prune. I don't. We don't prune hardly any of our buckwheats. Actually, I think some sometimes we'll we'll prune the uh, um, gigantium, which is the St. Catherine's lace, just because the flower stalks move into the into the pathway sometimes. But other than that, we generally don't don't prune the, the buckwheats. And what would you um, say about, or, and do, do buckwheats reseed from blooms? Um, some of them do, yes. Um, yes, a, a lot of them, actually. <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the, like a lot of the buckwheats out in, in the communities, if, if you're a garden member, are, are, are all just seedlings that come up. Um, and the Areogonum uh, scenarium, the the coastal. I don't. I don't. I think it's coastal or island island buckwheat. Um, will will reseed itself also. Um, but yeah, and the uh, Saint Catherine's lace will reseed like mad. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um in their jobs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what about um, uh, grass, native grasses in general? Do you the, pruning those back or? Grasses in general you can you can prune back um, depending on like for the warm season grasses you can prune after the warm season is over and cool season grasses after after the cool season. Um, and if you probably to a, a few inches of of plant material, you can also um, if you don't want to prune it back, you can also just rake out some of the the old material. We do that with the um, the Aristida purpurea, um, and you can do that with Mullenbergia, the deer grass, or their um, the carex carex species you can you can often rake out if if you don't because it do, it does look weird for a while after you coppice something but um, if you want to avoid that look for a while you can you can also just rake out some of the, the old material. Good recommendation. Um, I'm gonna try to do just a few more. We're we're a bit over time, but I want to get to all your questions. There's a lot of great ones, and um, so I guess a quick one is an enemy bush prunable. Anemone bush. Is there what's a, a n e n o m e bush? What's the what's the, <laughs> the the Latin name of the bat? It's like yeah. I know what I know what that is, but I can't think of the the Latin name for it. If bush and enemy, bush and enemy, Mullenbergia rigens or dubia. That's the that's deer grass. The Mullenbergia. Oh. They're saying they're white scented flowers. 
I'm not sure. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I should have my, my phone nearby to look. If you come up with, if. if oh, Carpinteria Californica. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't prune the Carpinteria very, very heavily. Um, you can probably deadhead some of the, the old flower stalks, but um, other than that, I, I would do very light pruning, if any. Thanks. And um, can we have, uh, can a single trunk redwood tree be coppiced to produce a multi-branched shrub? Probably. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it could. Okay. And um, do you, would you pinch brittle bush after coppicing to avoid from becoming too heavy? Um, like similar to the recommendation for Cleveland sage? Um, I, I would not pinch the brittle bush like, Coppicing could be sufficient for for a good degree of vigorous growth, um, and if the only other pruning that I think I would do with brittle bush would be to um, deadhead flowers in in springtime just to prolong the bloom of the plant. But I I wouldn't do anything beyond. Once you've coppiced and you have new growth coming up, I, I would tend to, to leave that alone. Okay. And um, then where where should you cut a damaged um, damaged leaves on agave? At the you you want to go back to the to the base of the plant if it's if it's a, a damaged leaf. And you can use a a little hand saw usually for that. Okay. And um, what about, what would you do with a uh, leggy uh, desert lavender? Um, you, you can prune that back, um, especially I say when it's, when it's young and you can prune a little, a little bit more consistently to have a more fuller, because it, it does get a bit leggy, um, but you can prune it back a, a bit. Um, I'd probably say into into second year growth would would probably be okay. Okay. And then, can you briefly speak about uh, pruning mallows? Yeah. Um, so mallows, you can usually just deadhead or cut back the um, like Malacca thamnus. You you can cut back a little bit more than say the Sporalsia species, excuse me. Um, uh, Malachithamnus, you can take down like a, about a third of the plant and the Sporalsia be a little more, um, more cautious in pruning and just remove the, the spent flowers, flower stalks. Okay. And so I'm just going to do three more questions, um, two specific about uh, specific plants. Uh, what, what about Dutchman's pipe? Um, can you prune that or do you prune that? Um, we do not prune that. Um, and I, I would have to look up if, if it takes pruning or not, actually. Okay. And um, what about orchid rock rose? Uh, can that take a heavy pruning? When would you think, would that be best to prune? Orchid rock rose. I might have to look that up also. Okay. <laughs> I, I've noticed I'm a common name person and most of the Horticulture staff are Latin names, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is kind of funny. I, it's uh, hard to recognize some of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cystus purpu, purpurus, purpurus? Purpurus? Oh, the, oh, so that Cystus is, is a rock rose. And 
I don't think that's a native plant, actually. So oh, okay. And well, I guess the maybe um, last two questions: Can grasses be mold and or be like mold be divided? Can grasses be divided? Yeah. I. Is yeah. it easy for propagation or? Yeah, mo most of them can can be divided. And it, yeah, that should that should be fine. Okay. And so I think our last question is more about the book. Um, so in the, in the chat, people have looked it up already. It looks like it's out of print and so very oh, expensive. Do you know, um, is there another care or maintenance book? I don't know what we have available online in the CalBG store. Um, yeah, there. I mean, there. There are a few. There's a. There's a book that I have on um, maintaining California native gardens throughout the year, um, and I'll. I'll give you the the name of that, and it's it's pretty helpful. I I'd say, and it it does have. Um, it mentions pruning for each, it's a month by month uh, book and so it it has some pruning information for each each month that that could be useful um, so I'll, I'll give you that the name of that book to send out to everyone I don't know off the top of my head yeah that'd be great so yeah I mean I, I will send a uh, follow-up email to you all with you know, additional resources, uh, the links, the websites that Ashley mentioned, the, the book that she's gonna get to us, and then I'll send her send you all a PDF of the slides and see if we can get the videos to you too. So you'll have all of this information in one email. Um, you, there was tons of questions. I hope we were able to address most of them. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a, a big topic. So we hope I hope you, had at least some of your questions answered. Um, and thank you, Ashley. This was really great, really informative. Um, and I hope everybody walks away feeling a little bit more confident about pruning their, their California natives. Thank you all. <laughs> hope you have a nice rainy, rainy day. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye, all.